Coming up on the SEO Weekly, we are going to dive into the state of technical SEO report from the Women in Tech SEO community and Patty Mugan and Era. 500 plus people contributed their insights all around what's going on with technical SEO. What's going on in-house? What's going on with agencies? Are budgets going up or going down? Why do you need to have a good relationship with your engineering team? Because it might take six months to get anything done. And bombshell fallout from The Verge, all about AI content being published. Remember CNET and Bankrate? Well, reputation, meat toilet, a little bit of egg on your face when the content isn't factually accurate. We're going to cover that and so much more, including my own personal philosophical take on AI generation. You can't avoid it. You can't avoid it. Okay. What do you say? Let's dive in. Welcome back to the SEO Weekly, where queries are weird, advice is controversial, and everything depends. I'm your host, Garrett Sussman of iPoll Rank, and every week I cover everything going on in the world of SEO. We're talking Google updates, blog posts, apparently AI generative content, and chat GPT all the time, all the time, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, podcast webinars, you name it, I'm on it. If you're into this stuff, please subscribe to the channel. Give us a like, share in the socials, put it put it in a Slack channel, you know, wherever anyone you think would appreciate it. Send an email. People still do email. It's snail mail. Why not? What'd you think of that intro? Try and trying some new things. Does that work for you? So much good stuff. So much good stuff. Let's get to it. Okay, first off, not a ton going on in the world of Google. We did have a really nice little video produced by Alan Kent and the e-commerce essentials. Uh, this one is all about tips in terms of getting the right structured data to Google so you are eligible for all the really cool visual enhancements. So the first thing, and we've talked about this in the past, all about structured data and providing any sort of product information so you can show up in the search results. So first off, there are two ways to do it. One is using structured data on your website. The second is the Google Merchant Center feed, depending on who has control of that. Google's recommendation is act actually doing both. But if you don't really have access you know, in your organization to the Google Merchant feed, make sure your structured data is accurate and up-to-date and comprehensive. Another tip that he provides is all around simpl simplifying the pricing based on what Google supports. So Alan points points out that you might have all sorts of discounts or different reasons that your pricing fluctuates. Google provides a certain amount of options, and unfortunately, you just have to go with what Google supports. So evaluate your own pricing options, evaluate Google's options, and choose the option that will provide the best customer experience. Remember, you do not want your customers to see a price showing up in a little rich snippet enhancement on Google and then get to your website and realize it's like 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 50% more. Don't do that to your customers. That's a really bad experience. And to that point, another little option is all around shipping information. Shipping can fluctuate. There are different shipping factors when it comes to you know priority or free shipping, this out of the other thing. Same sort of deal. Look at what Google supports, and obviously Google's always trying to add more, but choose whether they support and choose the best option that would create the least friction for your customers. He has some other tips in there. They're all worth um, you know, checking out in terms of if you are an e-commerce website. That's all the major stuff going on from Google this week. So let's move on to some of the other big, big stories. So the big featured story is the second annual State of Technical SEO Report 2023, which is produced by ERA and Women in Tech SEO. So Patty Mugan and Arija Bawali was released last week, and it is freaking awesome. Basically, they had 500 plus people contribute their perspectives on the state of technical SEO. Not only were there over 500 respondents, but a selection of women in tech SEO community members actually who are experts in technical SEO went into the findings and shared their perspectives, what resonated with them, what surprised them, what they agree with, what they disagree with. So not only do you have a lot of the, the survey data, you actually have some expertise and expert perspectives on that. And actually, it's it's 
broken up into some really interesting categories. So they obviously have an introduction, but then they also cover technical SEO tools and platforms, in-house specific questions, agency and freelancer specific questions, technical SEO careers, methodology and respondent demographics, and then their contributors and thank yous. So I'm not going to go into the entire report. There are some fascinating insights. What really stood out to me were some of the things that were covered in the in-house specific questions and the impact of technical SEO. So for the impact of technical SEO, the first question they dive into, which is really the big crux of getting stuff done at a company, whether you are massive or small, is what do you think is the biggest risk to technical SEO success? And not surprisingly, the number one answer was organizational lack of resources, that no one can get these changes made. 28% said that, but like right below that was technical debt. Surface level changes can be done, but it's too hard to change stuff that matters. So, you know, they actually mentioned later in the survey that, you know, there is a surprising amount that actually use a staging site before deploying, but some of these massive old school legacy websites have so much technical debt that you can't just easily make one change. You have to ensure that whatever you're changing isn't breaking the entire site. And we all know that happens way too often that when you make a change and you don't think about the consequences and you don't test at first, things break and you potentially lose a massive amount of organic traffic, hopefully not permanently, sometimes just temporarily. But you know, you should always can put in automated testing and a staging site before that happens in the first place. So Emma Thompson uh, shared her perspective. She said, it's our job to get technical SEO implemented. It's something is a risk to technical SEO success. It's a risk to business performance entirely. And we should be making clients aware of this at the earliest possible stage. These can be uncomfortable, but extremely necessary conversations to have. If you go about them professionally and productively, it can have a hugely positive impact to your daily working life and the results you're able to achieve. Reporting's big, right? So they asked, what one metric do you think is the most effective in measuring SEO performance? And so they covered actual organic traffic coming on top from like GA, conversion, so leads, revenue, which to me makes so much sense because ultimately you always want to tie SEO back to revenue. If you're just getting a bunch of traffic from things that are completely irrelevant, Is that really great performance that you want to share and brag about? Not really. You want to always tie it back to revenue in the first place. It's just, it's just harder to do that. Um, Rankings, obviously you want to pay attention to how your rankings, which will influence traffic, which will influence revenue, visibility, indexability, bounce rate, and time on site. What does Sam Torres think about that? Well, she says, I'm surprised that indexability isn't higher on this list. This definitely has felt like a year of crawled, but not indexed. So it'll be interesting to see if this changes for next year's results. I think that's definitely a key metric for enterprise websites at the very least. Personally, I agree with Sam. Honestly, with the flux of AI content being published and so much crappy content out there, We're going to see Google indexing is resource intensive. So it wouldn't surprise me if we see more and more content not or more pages not indexed. And that could be something that at least bigger sites focus on. But I do agree with the results that, you know, traffic and revenue should be at the top when it comes to those core metrics that are important to technical SEO. Okay, so the second section was technical SEO tools and platforms. And so what comes out from the question, it's pretty obvious, is that after Google Search Console, Screaming Frog is hands down the winner when it comes to everything and everything and everything and everything technical SEO. You know, whether it's which tools do you use for work or what's more effective, which one should you choose when crawling a website, what do you use? Screaming Frog, Screaming Frog, Screaming Frog, Screaming Frog. When Beyond Screaming Frog, when it comes to more like visibility questions, SEMrush actually has a slight advantage over Ahrefs, but generally across the board, SEMrush did a little bit better. 
I think that's kind of fascinating. I like both SEMrush and Ahrefs. They both have pros and cons. And and I agree. Obviously, Screaming Frog is what's up. Although, you know, there's some cool features from Sightbulb. Pay attention because we'll get to Sightbulb later in this episode. So what do the experts think when it comes to technical SEO tools? Well, Catherine Nwanaru, uh agrees with everyone, basically says, Google Search Console dominates the list, and rightfully so. I also agree with Screaming Frog SEO Spider as a second favorite for technical SEO work. Great insights at a low price, which makes sense with Screaming Frog that it's one of the cheaper tools and does so much. Like so much. SEMrush and Ahrefs are much more expensive, and Ahrefs keeps raising their prices, but Screaming Frog stays at a low, low price, and everyone loves it for that. The other component of technical SEO tools is the platforms, the CMSs. And actually, there was a lot, pretty much consensus when it comes to what is the best non e commerce platform to use WordPress. Now, it's interesting that WordPress does have its security issues. It's open source, it doesn't cost anything, but, and there are a lot of ways for it to get really messed up with technical SEO. But 71% of people prefer that over some of the other options. And then, what is the worst? I feel bad because the Wix team is doing so much with branding to build up the reputation of Wix, but. 20% still think that Wix is the most problematic. Sorry, Crystal, Morty, George, and all the great team over there, but still have work to do. And I wonder to what extent that is a you know legacy hearsay or if they still are running to issues with the product. Then when it comes to e-commerce, the top two are actually Shopify and WooCommerce. WooCommerce is actually a, a plugin that can work on WordPress. So it makes sense that that would be very popular, but those are the most popular when it comes to e-commerce platforms. Magento, not, not that great. Magento is at the top. It's been here forever. It's a little complicated to use, similar with Drupal. Drupal is like a complete headache. Interestingly enough, even though Shopify was one of the top, it is also one of the bottom. So polarizing polarizing when it comes to the platform. So those are the tools. What, what do you think? Which ones do you use? So a couple of interesting takeaways when it comes to in-house specific questions. For instance, the majority of in-house teams are not outsourcing work to external agencies, freelancers, contractors, like 70 plus percent are not doing that. The technical SEO team falls under marketing, not product, not engineering, not in its own department for the most part. The majority of these teams have like three to five SEOs and the budget is ultimately pretty much staying the same. It does seem like with the economic situation, a lot more organizations are actually hiring in-house and building out in-house teams as opposed to working with agencies, which makes a lot of sense. One thing, one offering that I pull rank actually has is helping uh, in-house teams build their SEO team because we know how competitive it's been to hire SEOs. There aren't enough people with the right skill set and being trained for you know the way that SEO is is changing. So it's one thing to keep in mind. Reach out to us if if you want to talk about building your SEO team. So one really important aspect of technical SEO that's reflected in this report is implementing changes that you need to happen on the site. And a lot of times technical SEOs don't have the authority to do it all themselves. So it makes sense that the majority of teams have an in-house development team to do it. But when it comes to working with developers, it can be very challenging. So when asked, when you work with web developers to implement SEO tasks, do they have time set aside regularly for this or do you need to request it ad hoc? And so what is, I guess, kind of obvious is that they have to request a time as when I need it, which is like 55%. And then others actually 20% had, I have constant quick access to developers who can make changes straight away. That's surprising that it's that large. Relationships with your engineers as a technical SEO is so critical, right? And some of the questions really speak to that in-house, which is really interesting. On one end, you have like, what's the longest it's taken to get some of your technical SEO request changes done? And for the most part, it's been everywhere from like a month plus, a month, three months, six months, a year. The fastest actually had some, a lot of people said they've had stuff done in the day. But for the most part, it takes about a week 
or about a month or even three months, according to the more, more typical time frame for getting technical SEO changes implemented. I can imagine the better relationship that you have and the more organized you are and the better prepared you are to get technical SEO recommendations to the engineering team, the more likely you'll have them done quickly. Also, depending on the organization of your engineering team, but build those relationships, build those processes, you know, work with stakeholders, specifically when it comes to what is typically the main blocker for getting changes made to the site, existing non-SEO development tasks and lack of buy-in from stakeholders. So obviously you have to be able to make a compelling argument of why they should be should prioritize your work. Actually, actually makes me think of Adam Jen's SEO sprints. If you ever need help in terms of putting together a great compelling plan, both his articles and his newsletter there, and then Tom Critchlow for SEO MBA, both have great advice for working with stakeholders and making compelling arguments, specifically working with engineers in Adam Jen's place. So how do you present your technical SEO recommendations to your stakeholders? Well, typically what uh, the respondent says was dev tickets, so like Jira or Asana, which is their preferred uh, project management tool of choice for technical SEOs, uh, Google Excel, uh, Google Sheet or Excel or Google Sheets, and then like Slack and Instant Chat, which I can't imagine people get as much done if you're just flipping things over to devs that way. Curious if people schedule a call uh, or meeting with stakeholders? Yes, 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 yes. 75% said absolutely. And finally, how, how do you prioritize the technical SEO tasks in terms of implementation, in terms of like, what are you going to put in front of uh, the, the engineers? Because you know, it's going to be hard to get a lot of it done. Like you can't ask for everything. You have to prioritize. So the answers were number one, quick wins, big impact, little effort. Two, expected impacts on KPIs, probably mostly on revenue. Uh, three, impact on users. Four, best practices based on Google guidelines. And five, industry changes and algorithm updates. And one last interesting thing about in-house and working with developers and, and how you get all that done, uh, the respondents were asked, typically, are your technical SEO recommendations deployed to a live to a staging environment prior to live. And surprisingly and amazingly, 78% said yes. So it's not like mistakes are shipped out the door more often than not. So there you have it. The state of technical SEO, there's so much more in there. Like if you work for an agency, there's a whole agency section. Um, definitely check out their methodology. Check out the specific uh, uh, kind of perspectives of the different experts who participated and shared their thoughts on the results. All in all, a fantastic piece of work by Arij and Patty, the whole Women in Tech SEO community, and everyone who, who responded. It's always really fascinating to see how everyone else is dealing with similar tech SEO problems, what sort of uh, themes you've seen in terms of budgets and money and processes and workflows and headcount and this, that, and the other thing, and priorities. Anyway, uh, thank you all for putting, putting that together. So definitely check out that full report. Okay, moving on to AI generative content and SEO. We covered it in depth last week. We're going to continue covering it because it continues to hit the news. In fact, if you remember, we covered all about how reputable publications like Bankrate.com in the financial sector, CNET with technology, and creditcards.com were all publishing articles with a little disclaimer that they were being assisted and written by AI, but reviewed by editorial teams. Well, last week, a couple of bombshell journalistic articles came out from The Verge and Futurism, respectively, that kind of shed some light on what's really problematic about these websites. So first off, The Verge, Inside CNUT's AI-powered SEO money machine by Mia Sato and James Vincent, fake bylines, content farming, affiliate fees, what happens when private equity takes over a storied news site and milks it for clicks. So this devastating article basically points out how CNET used to write, you know, really great reviews of all different tech. And then a few years ago, they were purchased by Red Ventures. Red Ventures, as opposed to focusing on the journalistic approach to reviews, start really focusing on affiliate marketing because the, this type of SEO farming, 
as quoted in the article, can be massively lucrative. The idea is, for those of you who don't do affiliate SEO, uh, you get a specific link URL that can be attributed back to your site. And when someone actually purchase, purchases a product or a service, then you get a little commission for it. So for instance, on uh, Bankrate, if you, someone clicks on the link and signs up for a credit card, it could be worth as much as $250, $900. It is uh, a valuable opportunity for the publishing uh, industry. And so what Red Ventures did is they started to really focus on affiliate marketing for the sake of generating revenue, maybe at the expense of journalism. I don't know. I haven't read CNET in a while. But this article kind of goes on to say some of the issues internally when writers and teams and editorial teams don't necessarily know what's going on with everything being siloed by a private equity firm, you don't know who's using what tools. So for instance, why are silos problems and the tools and the AI? Well, Sometimes the money writers write like they're bots too, and they're regular humans, a former employee says. The quality of writing is nearly indistinguishable. That does not make it good. And their other kind of perspective was it was a good way to generate content that would take human writers longer, the dull SEO friendly topics, which makes sense. If there's something that doesn't need a ton of subject matter expert knowledge that they could actually go and have the AI write it, especially as pointed out in the article that they were taking kind of a programmatic SEO approach in the sense that they wanted to write a daily article about mortgage rates and financial rates. And so they would have the same formula, story formula, and they would just kind of switch up the, the content slightly with the new stats, but it was basically a programmatic SEO effort and it would rank well because it's AI content. Well, here's where things got really, really bad. In the other article by Futurism, CNET's article writing AI is already publishing very dumb errors by John Christian. Uh, he points out and acknowledges that after the big news about them using AI content, that when you look at the articles, there are in fact some really big errors and issues. And when you're talking about financial, you know, information, financial advice, that's really problematic. And it's almost surprising in some ways that Google didn't catch this because we're talking your money, your life, which they tend to take very, very seriously. So one example, for instance, was in the article, it says with mortgages, car loans and personal loans, interest is usually calculated in simple terms. For example, if you take out a car loan for $25,000 and your interest rate is 4%, you'll pay a flat $1,000 in interest per year. And so one of the people who assess this, who, who from the article says, that's just simply not the case, that it would be 1000 per year in interest. As the loan balance is being reduced every year and you only pay interest on the outstanding balance. So this is a significant issue. And so basically CNET gets called out in this futurism article, which highlights with AI generated content, if your editorial team is not actually fact checking, you're going to have some inaccurate factual articles. And, and that's a major, major issue. When reached out for comment, the spokesperson from CNET said, a brief statement about the corrections because they wanted to go back in and fix the articles after it was brought to their attention. We are actively reviewing all our AI assisted pieces to make sure no further inaccuracies made it through the editing process as human makes mistakes too. They said, we will continue to issue any necessary conditions according to CNET's correction policy. So good PR speak, they're gonna try and fix the issue. It's not really a great look to to say, you know, same as same as if human writers did it, because I believe there would be a higher standard for AI content to get it right. This is a big, you know, reputation hit for publications like CNET and Bankrate, because who's going to trust now that the AI content is getting it right? And as this becomes a mainstream story, that's also going to hurt folks. Uh, who are using AI generative content transparently in general for the industry going forward. Now, does it matter in the eyes of Google? Well, Google is not going to like the way this is. So wouldn't be surprised if they got a manual review of the website all of a sudden, looking at the AI content and seeing if it's factually edited. 
which leads to another potential consequence of all this, right? If you're transparently saying that an AI wrote the content, then it's going to generate attention and maybe not in the best way. You're basically going to have that much more scrutiny. And even though, as we mentioned last week, Danny Sullivan said, you know, Google doesn't care if the if the content's written by AI uh, or a human as long as it's helpful. Well, now they're going to start looking at it maybe more manually and saying, oh, well, they're not going to look at it manually, only if it becomes a big PR issue. But that's not to say that you are safe just by using AI content, especially if that content is wrong. So big takeaway with any of this is I'm not and I'm still not anti AI generative content. We're still at the early stages and there's still a ton of value for what AI generated content can produce. The thing is, and I'll beat this drum over and over and over again is it has to be factually correct. It has to be reviewed. You cannot just publish it with someone who's not a subject matter expert and doesn't know what they don't know. If they don't know what's wrong, they're not going to correct it. So you have to create that much more scrutiny and, and for the for the content. And maybe that might set you back in the long run with higher editorial standards. That said, you know, if, if you have poor human writers, you're going to run into the same issue. But the big lesson is you can still use AI generative content. It's not automatically a manual penalty, but you really have to make sure that it is accurate at the very, very least. So Will Reynolds put out a really interesting POV all around how will AI generated content impact the ROI of SEO and content. And the way he's thinking about it has to do with how much should you be investing in certain kind of sectors of SEO and content that will ultimately generate revenue. So for instance, he thinks about short-term risks and long-term risks. Short-term risk being which types of queries and keywords that you're trying to rank for can easily be disrupted by AI content where they can at scale produce good enough content that's going to rank higher than you where it might not be worth it for you to actually try to outrank them, especially if they're not driving revenue to your website. Now, the long-term view is about the ROI of whether or not Google or Bing ultimately, you know, their paradigm shifts where they they kind of take GPT or any of this AI generation or AI search and implement it in a way that nobody has any sort of value when it comes to the, the content and search, which will change the game, you know, entirely. But going back to the short term, he actually goes through some steps that you can do to identify what publications are already using AI generated content and how are they ranking and then going through all their sites and seeing how it's performing and then identifying by combining with other data like click through rate data from Google search console or ad data to be able to tell you how much revenue, um, how competitive they are, maybe how much revenue is being generated to your website and taking all that data and information and assessing the risk and whether or not you don't have to worry about anything and so you can keep your strategy strategy as is, or if it's reasonable to, um, to think, okay, well, AI is going to impact my bottom line, we need to rethink this. Uh, he also goes in showing their own proprietary tool, Supernova, and how, you know, by dumping all the data, you can surface it with hypotheses. So as mentioned before, you know, simple example, he points out, but like, if you're seeing that People also ask are like the second or third result. Maybe those are highly likely to be disrupted by AI generated content and therefore it's not worth going for. So if you're looking at scale with all of this data being combined together, you can start to surface those insights and adjust your SEO strategy accordingly. Really, really smart thinking by Will. Definitely check out that POV. So we actually published a great blog post on iPoll Rank last week all about AI generation. Uh, senior content strategist Kyle Marino wrote about the role of generative AI in content production. 
Great post that obviously explains what generative AI is, but goes through a lot of the benefits of using it and how it can save you time and things like outlining or writing like little small elements of copy or a little bit of researching as long as you're you're fact checking, obviously, um, and even drafting, you know, like obviously you never, 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 as we learned from CNET one to put out like a raw version of AI generated generative content. You always need to review. And obviously if you don't know, you don't know, you need to reach out to a subject matter expert, but it can save you time, at least in that first draft, which will allow you to do more things like you know, align it to your topic clustering strategy with internal linking or actually adding information game by reaching out to subject matter experts to get quotes, to add their experience or expertise to lift up the authority of the content. He also talks about some of the limitations, which we've discussed before, which is so important. The fact that, you know, ChatGPT, for instance, was trained on materials from 2021. So if you're writing an article about current events in 2023, you're probably going to have a really bad time. Now, remember that the AI generative content isn't necessarily a deal breaker for Google. Danny Sullivan did say last week, a couple of weeks ago, that you know Google doesn't really care if it's AI content or a human as, as long as it's helpful. We'll see if the, the data kind of bears that out because it'll be interesting to see what happens with CNET and Bankrate with, you know, at least seen at being exposed for wrong content with transparency on the label. But, um, you know, it is important maybe to ensure that your content doesn't obviously come off as AI. And in fact, there are a bunch of tools that you can use. Valentina Izzo of WordLift put out a great post all around the five best plagiarism checkers for AI generated content. Um, her recommendations were uh, GPT Radar, Originality, Originally.ai, GPT Zero, Turn It In, and Copy Leaks. They're not all perfect. There have been a couple situations where I wrote out some content that was obviously written by a human and it thought it was definitely written by an AI, which is a little bit of problematic. And in my honest opinion, I think that Google can probably detect whether or not your content was written by AI or a human. Uh, their technology is so much more sophisticated than ours. Now, not definitively, if you actually go in and write you know, make edits, then hopefully they understand that it's, it's mostly human generated, but there are a lot of false positives. Ultimately, people are still figuring out how to incorporate AI generated content or AI automation into their workflows. And there's a lot of brilliant ideas out there, uh, but it's still a work in progress. You need to know the limitations and not just try to take advantage of the benefits because if you don't, you're going to have a really bad time. Also, uh, Thursday, as I mentioned, we're coming up with our free webinar Thursday, the 26th at 12 p.m. Myself and Andrea Volpini of WordLift are going to be doing AI content for SEO, how to avoid pitfalls and achieve success. So really kind of going through the ins and outs of what you should be doing with your AI content workflow, how you can use it to your advantage and not screw yourself over or screw over your reputation. So definitely sign up for that. The link to the registration is in the description for that. So yeah. There you go. So speaking of chat GPT resources or AI generation resources in general, uh, Matt Tutt actually put together another piece where he rounded up 24 experts to share how they were using chat GPT to help with their efforts. And, and obviously the funny thing is people aren't really comfortable just sharing their prompts. You'll see like all these collections of prompts and we're working on our library of chat GPT prompts, but people are just sharing their, their basic ideas. So maybe this will get their, your creativity stirring, whether it's, you know, assisting keyword research by classifying search intent for Madden Brown or helping with link building processes by tweaking Google short sheets formulae, like from James Taylor, creating schema code from uh, Steph Andrusjak, uh, helping brainstorm improvements by Ken Marshall. The list goes on and on. A lot of really cool ideas like using it in JavaScript or using it to build tools or using it just as a tool within the process and not to replace a person. Great job by Matt to round that up. So you can check out the, the full set of ideas from Matt Tutt in the show notes there. And that was also included in Aleda Solis's learning SEO 
website where she curates all the great resources across the internet, across all things SEO. Now there's a chat GPT for SEO section, which makes a ton of sense, whether it's hers or you know Chris Kemper's extension that we mentioned, or uh, Andrew Shotland's roundup that we talked about last week, or even our own uh, Mike King's, you know, kind of what you need to know and why it's not a threat blog post. So check out Aleda's resource too, and I'm sure she'll continue to update that. Meanwhile, in the Twitterverse, I don't think anyone is more annoyed by ChatGPT than Ryan Jones. He tweeted last week, I'm really getting tired of talking about ChatGPT. BT for, but the vast majority of SEOs talking about it seem to greatly misunderstand what it's actually doing and how it actually works. That's going to be a problem at some point, I think. And so a bunch of replies. I mean, it is a polarizing topic, but there's an interesting back and forth between James Shea and Ryan Jones. James wrote, I think you're missing the point. Think about the user's point of view. A user can get the information from a bad blog post, which the SEO industry has made a living at for a decade on an AI-generated piece of content content, this stuff will greatly impact our industry, which Ryan replies, well, for SEOs creating content, quote unquote, about basic information that isn't curated or based on experience, or recommendations, insights, opinions, et cetera, sure. But those users just wanted a number for useful, unique, trustworthy content with insight that helps users do something. No. To which James says, oh, you mean good writing? Ha. Huh. I don't find a lot of that on the internet. I see a lot of SEO generated who, what, why content. I imagine 50% of the internet could disappear and nobody would care. Ryan Jones replies, this is a real problem, to be honest. Most of the internet is spam. Yeah, and to be honest, it is probably going to be get worse. It is really important to understand how to use these AI tools, and in fact, Lily Ray said, you know, if everyone's using it, isn't this going to be a problem? She tweeted, AI content might seem unique to search engines for now, but won't the content start to become diluted or duplicative when many other content creators start to rely on similar tools and similar prompts to generate content? And there are a lot of responses to Lily's tweet, to which Ian Lurie pointed out, and that's why custom models and skilled editorial teams will become increasingly important. So for anyone who's freaking out about AI content, A, it's not all chat GPT. You can train these, these AI content generators on your own data, on your own documents, and different content models will produce different types of content. You know, for the, the big boys and girls with all the resources and money, they'll be able to produce their own content models, which will have their own tone and voice and will be completely different from what you're seeing in the commodified market. The other thing is editorial teams will continue to have value as well as just great writers or subject matter experts who can also write. That experience, that expertise, that authority is going to be hard to replicate through purely AI generated content. It's not that people are going to be eliminated. It's that the bad is going to get weeded out and it's just going to change the way that we create content in general. It's a tool. It's not it's not going to replace anyone. It's just going to make things different. And the people who see that are going to benefit and they're going to capitalize on it by jumping on this technology and understanding the right ways to use it. So Brody Clark did a really interesting experiment all around Twitter carousels. He basically tweeted an experiment to have people go to a search query that would have had his Twitter carousel and click on a link in one of his tweets. And then he looked at the data in Google Analytics and Google Search Console to determine just some interesting statistics. So like in Google Analytics, how you know the non-indexed page from the link that people clicked to uh, showed up as organic search despite it not being indexed. And then in Google Search Console, how there were different spikes in impressions and maybe not necessarily clicks that were influenced by both location and device. And you could see that very clearly in the data set based on the link in his Google Search Console uh, data and reporting. So it was just a really interesting way to show that you know the 
Twitter carousel fluctuates depending on your device or sometimes doesn't even show up at all depending on your location. Um, how it doesn't matter, it can show up for both branded and non-branded search. How it can show how sometimes it's hard to determine, but that might be why you see impression spikes at certain times. Uh, he saw an example from Morty Oberstein that showed that specifically when uh, search for a query SEO had a spike because a link showed up in a Twitter carousel for SEO rant. Really fascinating study by Brody. Definitely uh, fun to experiment and seeing what happens there. So a really important piece written by Rejoice Ojiaku on the Uncrawl blog, all around content inclusivity, uh, everything you need to know. It's important because representation matters. Feeling included matters. There are so many different ways that our words and our images and our design and the way our sites are built can exclude people and make them feel other, make them feel not a part of anything. I don't know if it's woke or not, but I just feel like uh, representation matters, that making people feel like something can be for them matters. And I'm not going to lie. It's very difficult. Rejoice makes a good point that you don't want inclusivity to feel like a chore, um, making your website accessible to people who are deaf or blind or colorblind, um, you know, to different body types or different ethnicities. Like we, <laughs> I know I'm going to sound all hippy dippy. I'm not like the most spiritual person ever, but you don't want to make people feel bad. You know, you don't, you don't want to make people feel not included. And it makes a difference for representation in the images of people of different backgrounds. So she, she lays it out and it's, it's really important to think about, and it's worth the time, even if it doesn't always lead to profitability, which a lot of businesses only care about, but she breaks it down as Understand your audience better in terms of demographic, experiential, cognitive. Be intentional with inclusivity as marketers, our words, actions, and choices matter. Think usability, accessibility, and inclusivity. Even if a user's characteristics aren't specifically pertinent to the piece, you still should make sure uh, to make sure your content adheres to all three. Rethink adjectives and other descriptions. For instance, negative concepts are frequently expressed symbolically by using words like black, dark, and blind. There are numerous possibilities and methods for diver uh, diversifying the symbolism we employ. That imagery can speak, let it. Keep incorporating the connections, openness, and balanced metaphors into your images. And don't make assumptions. And don't forget relevancy matters here too. Um, I try I try to be really good about being inclusive. I don't always do the best. Um, and I do want to be called out and mentioned, like not embarrassed by it, but you know, in private, it's good to mention it to someone if something is not inclusive or they could be better. There was an issue that came up and I'm not going to shame the SEO conference that um, is happening in Asia that didn't include any Asian speakers. But I do, I do think that you can intentionally pick your speaker lineup uh, to be more diverse and representative, especially if you're in a place that, you know, someone from that, from that area should represent for an SEO conference. That's just my perspective. So great piece worth reading. Great choice by Rajoice uh, Ojaku. She continually bangs that drum of inclusivity and, and I respect the hell out of her for it. So there you go. So Phil Rosek is under the radar, one of the nicest guys in local SEO. He's been doing it for a long, long time, kind of an individual consultant. But every year he's been putting out, this is the fourth edition for the One Sitting Guide to Effective Local SEO. Now it's a free download, but it's a spreadsheet with all of his links for what you should be doing to build visibility in local. And he knows it inside and out. So he's got like, you know, one-time steps, you like set it and forget it. Like you're good to go. Long-term strategies and principles across the board, whether it's, you know, building out content, internal linking, how to handle your Google business profile, all these really, really helpful, actual gems to game visibility in local search. Highly recommend you download it. Phil is a fantastic human being and a really knowledgeable local SEO. So yeah, support him and, and get that resource because it's freaking awesome. Love me some Phil. So to continue to bounce off that experience in EEAT when it comes to like the quality rater guidelines and improving those signals as an authority um, with those experience and expertise signals to Google to rank higher. When it comes to e-commerce, Dan Taylor wrote a great piece for Search Engine Land all about e-commerce content, how to demonstrate 
beneficial purpose and expertise. So without necessarily messing up the search intent, the purpose of the page, how can you show that experience? Gave a bunch of great examples, for instance, uh, like on Holt, the cigar maker, having articles written by experts and then rating them and showing that sort of you know, social proof there. He shows how Amazon's been doing it forever with Q&A using user-generated content. And even uh, when it comes to Card Kingdom and having pro tips on specific cards, basically putting things that differentiate you that isn't just trying to like surface a specific keyword, but actually puts helpful content from the experience of the users or the experts. This is a great piece from Dan. Definitely create some insights if you're, you know, in e-commerce. So fun little uh, A-B test by Ruth Everett on Search Pilot. She asked, does redirecting trailing slash URLs to the non-trailing slash equivalent improve organic traffic? And what she found, so naturally they had a Example client who, you know, had both here and there and need to redirect some of those 301. So good opportunity to test it. They asked a poll to on Twitter and LinkedIn to see what people thought. Would would it be positive, negative, uh, or or would it be no detectable impact? And most people said no detectable impact. And to some extent, they were right. It was somewhat included conclusive because while it was positive, it wasn't statistically significant. There was evidence that our customers saw benefits by adding 301 directs from trailing slash URLs to non-trailing slash URLs site-wide. But even though our customer likely saw some positive impact, it was not large enough to justify a high level of effort despite being a standard SEO best practice recommendation. So there you go. Moderate gains, is it worth investing the time in doing it? Maybe, maybe not, but it's always interesting to see the data kind of, you know, back up or disqualify a hypothesis based on best practices. So Sitebulb released a new feature. Sounds pretty cool. Basically, it's the Sitebulb server. What does it do? Well, the Sitebulb server gives you your very own dedicated crowd crawler. Uh, it's built for scale, dedicated for teams, remotely accessible, perfect for regular recurring audits, and data accessible via API. So super helpful when you have people all over the place, you know, desktop, remote, could be issues with other servers, just desktop software. So using Sitebulb with a dedicated server helps you avoid those problems, especially for enterprise. So really cool feature release by the team there. And finally, uh, Market Muse put out a really great set of updates recently. And um, Jeff Coyle and Steven Jeske did a really awesome webinar where they walk you through the step-by-step -step process on to evaluate the content of your site and the competition and how to create a content strategy that's data-backed, specifically in the context of topic clusters and identifying like gaps of where you're missing content, where you need to update your content or add complete completely new content or link to other content. They go through it. It's comprehensive and it's all semantically related based on how authoritative your site is for your topic. So for instance, if it's something you're already doing well on that you actually have a chance in terms of difficulty to rank by building out that topic further versus something that is completely not related to your site. If you just made an article for it, it's, it's not going to generate any traffic. So this is a really cool cool tool. Highly recommend you talk to Jeff and the team at Market Muse if this is something you want to like kind of try out and, and work with. But uh, we we love it at iPoll, right? We love Market Muse's tool. So really great update by the guys. Watch the whole webinar so you can get inspired uh, creatively to build out your own topic cluster strategy. So cool. There you go. That's it. Another Big, big old episode of the SEO Weekly in the books. I know I know it's actually time for me to stop shooting because the sun is setting, as you can see in the reflection. I got to work on my lighting, but so much great stuff, so much AI content. Let me know in the con comments, are you still into all this chat GPT AI generated, generative content or are you over it at this point? Should I continue to focus on that in the SEO Weekly? Because it still feels like the major conversation. As always, Thank you for watching. If you're into this, please subscribe, give a like, share on the social, share it via email or in some Slack channel with someone who you think would uh, benefit from this information. My name is Garrett Sussman of iPoll Rank. As always, appreciate you and we will catch you next week. Peace.